All right, so today I am going to talk a little about something called spiritual materialism, which is basically just um, the idea that we really want to make sure that the spiritual practices that we do uh, stays true to the goal of spirituality, which is a connection with God, and doesn't stray into becoming something that might actually take us further away from that connection. So I'm going to start by kind of giving a little bit of a background of why this is so such an important topic. So, you know, most people recognize religion and spirituality as this wonderful thing that can provide a lot of joy and fulfillment to them. But there are, actu there are a lot of people in this world as well who think that religion and spirituality are actually an evil on this world, especially, you know, the atheists and, and particularly some very outspoken atheists. And what a lot of these people will say is that as much good as religion does, it can do just as much harm, and and some of them would argue that it does even more harm than, than good on the world. And the reasoning that people like this will often give, and I've you know I've got some friends who who are atheists, and the, they will speak in this manner. You know, they will talk about things like the Crusades or the Inquisition and, you know, the politically charged battles that will, you know, we see in Palestine. And then, um, of course, mention things like the absolutely tragic events that we've seen unfold due to religious terrorism. And I do want to take a moment in this talk, since it's such a, you know, recent topic, to just say that, you know, I have the utmost sympathy and compassion for those grieving family members who had uh, people that they loved whose lives were taken in, in the recent attacks. And those who lost their lives were doing, you know, really amazing work at the time, trying to help others escape this deteriorating situation. And so I do want to take a moment to commend those for their bravery and their courage to show up to do such a difficult job and end up suffering the worst base fate imaginable while being of service to others and the world. And I know that we all feel the heartbreak and grief that is just reverberating around the world right now. And when we see these, you know, terrible events happen and we know that they're you know, w we can't obviously blame religion or spirituality for these events. I mean, these were carried out by very wicked and evil individuals. So really, religion and spiritu spirituality doesn't necessarily have to do with it in our minds. But in a, in a lot of other people's minds, they do see that how religion and spirituality can go so wrong. And it kind of brings up this question of, you know, how is it that someone who practices religion and spirituality devotedly commits such terrible acts in the name of their faith? I mean, why is that? Why, why is it that spirituality can result in such tragic outcomes when we know that it can also be this incredibly beautiful and powerful and fulfilling thing? So that's kind of the question that I'm seeking to answer in this talk, is how is it that how is it that religion and spirituality can go wrong in so many cases? Um, and so first of all, it's good to ask what, you know, what really is the point of spirituality? What, why do we do this practice? And obviously everybody has their own individual reasons for why they get into religious or spiritual practices. And for everybody it's a little bit different. But there is one thread that I feel like connects pretty much everyone's spiritual practice. And that, uh, that thread is that there is a belief in some greater power. And 
This power might be known by all sorts of different names, God, Yahweh, Allah, Brahman, etc. And different belief systems will have different forms or ideas of what this power is. But what everything shares is this essential quality that this power is something beyond our physical material reality and it exists in some either dimension or place that's spiritually above us uh, or above our human forms and this is kind of the key so i think that what most of us would agree that one of the primary points of spirituality or, or religion from kind of a utility point of view and, and also from the point of view of unity is to forge a connection with this greater power however we might view it and through our spiritual or religious practices our goal is to strengthen this connection and uh, eventually become one with this power or experience oneness so in unity we have our fourth principle that describes exactly this stating that through prayer and through meditation it aligns us to this greater power and it allows us to experience oneness with the great power in the universe so unity kind of outlines it pretty clearly and and that is when we practice our spiritual techniques whether that's meditation or prayer that is basically our goal so what we're doing in religion obviously there's a lot of side goals that we might have in this process but one of the most primary goals is that practice of doing various things whether it's med some pe some people it's prayer and meditation other people it's singing hymns other people it's reading books you know everyone has their own method but everyone shares that same fundamental goal of connecting to something higher and greater than themselves so if we can agree that that's the shared goal of practitioners then how is it that so many who are traveling the same path really can diverge in such wrong ways because the path towards connecting and becoming one with the divine power is a fairly clear road up the mountain of enlightenment if that's the only goal that we focus on and yet we see so many practitioners of religion and spirituality take these crazy detours off this road and do all these actions that really have nothing to do with connecting themselves to a greater power but they do it in the name of this power anyways. So what's going on here? And to understand why so many people will go wrong on this path and why oftentimes, without even realizing it, we're going to go wrong ourselves, or we, we can possibly go wrong ourselves, one of the first things we need to recognize is that the true, pure goal of connecting and becoming one with divinity does hold a danger for ourselves as individuals and this is what i mean when we actually attain whether it's through deep deep meditation or deep prayer an actual state or sensation of divine oneness uh, it usually involves a surrender or a sacri sacrifice at the same time of our ego and our identity and the reason why it usually involves this is because we cannot obtain enlightenment and a true, deeply spiritual connection with the divine while being our selves, that is, our flesh and blood human selves. It's only when we release our attachment to the physical world that we can really experience this true connection. And if you think about it, this makes a lot of sense because if, as we said, the divine exists or at least the pure essence of the divine exists at, outside of this earthly physical realm then we wouldn't be able to truly connect with it as our earthly physical selves the only the true connection happens when we are able to rise above it however our physical self and our ego doesn't like getting surrendered or given up so it's kind of like the way that that gravity is always there to keep us down to earth and you know when we engineers try to shoot a rocket up into space they have to fight tooth and nail 
with gravity trying to escape the atmosphere. And it's the same thing. When we're trying to rise above ourselves and experience this beautiful connection with the divine and let our spirits kind of rise above this earthly experience and experience some higher thing, we have a gravity in, our, in ourselves, a spiritual gravity, which is our ego. And the ego has a lot of tricks to transform spirituality from something which normally would allow us to release the ego and release our identity and attain this connection with you know, our inner Christ or our inner divine power, whatever you'd like to call it. Uh, and it, it will take this spiritual power and then actually twist it into something that strengthens itself. And so that's kind of the danger that I'd like to talk about today. So before we can kind of explore and, and identify how this happens, the first thing we've got to do is define, you know, what do I mean by the ego? Because, a lot, you know, in regular conversation and the, dec the dictionary definition of the ego is usually a person's self-esteem or self-importance. So in conversations, we'll say, oh, this person has an ego. And we usually mean they're maybe a little arrogant or very self-important or even a little bit narcissistic. But obviously, you know, just to maintain clarity, in this case, I'm not using that definition. I'm using ego in the, w in the definition that it's used in more spiritual texts, especially in uh, unity and, and even Buddha's teachings as well. So in this paradigm, the word ego uh, is literally defined as it is defined in the Latin language. So in Latin, the word ego simply means I or myself. So from this view, when I say ego, it means me or you as an individual entity that is separate from others. So in spiritual terms, all the meanings and forms and concepts that we wrap up in our identity is the ego. And it manifests itself as the majority of our consciousness which wants it to which wants to preserve this idea of the self as opposed to the part of the consciousness which connects to the oneness of everything and the divine and that part of ourselves is the part of ourselves that doesn't want to hold on to this idea that we're separate it wants to experience oneness and and unity so now, it's, it's very common once we kind of recognize this dichotomy between the ego and between the part of ourselves that wants to connect with the oneness to view the ego in a bad way. But it's important not to see the ego in a negative light. It's simply our nature as humans to have it. The same way that we have a body which becomes hungry and thirsty when we need food to survive and stay functioning, we also have an ego which uses various mechanisms to try and keep our self-identity and our personal consciousness alive. And so just as we don't see our digestive system as a bad thing, uh, we must not view our ego as a bad thing either. It's just something to understand. And as we understand it, we can hopefully overcome it. So now just like the way that our body grew, it didn't. the ego was not always there. So at the first moment of our consciousness, there was some fundamental state of mind before the ego was created that was op totally open and free and had a spacious quality to it. And when we first saw something, in that first instance, there was only the perception of the environment or the object around us. And it had no concepts or logic in it whatsoever. You could say that in that moment, our consciousness was the object in a way. And then in the next instant, our, a sort of mental panic starts and our consciousness rushed about to add something to it, find a name for the object, a feeling associated with the object, create mental concepts to categorize the object. And this is where, this is the first moment that the ego developed. So once we have the idea that we are some entity perceiving this thing outside of ourselves, we became self-conscious and we lost our connection to that fundamental openness that we started off with at the very, very, very beginning. So, and that's only natural for us. So this is the first moment of the ego when we s experience duality, space and I. I am here in space seeing this object outside of myself. And over time, we collect concepts and categories and ideas and we basically build this 
you know, mental room filled with various objects that form our identity. And this beautiful openness that we used to have has kind of been covered up by various concepts and mental formations that we collect over time. So as we continue this process, the structure of the ego becomes stronger and heavier over time, and it becomes more con more sophisticated, and it confirms and interprets. And so uh, in Buddhist literature, there's this really wonderful metaphor that I'd like to use to kind of describe it. So it is said that at the beginning, before our ego is fully developed, we are like monkeys that started out in the total up openness of like a beautiful jungle, which basically represents the truth of the universe. But over time, we build ourselves an elaborate house with walls all around ourselves and five windows. And we spend years and years toiling over this house and building it and filling it with the most wondrous treasures we can find until it's filled with all of our favorite possessions and we clothe ourselves with fine garments. However, we are so focused on building the house and the treasures that we never make a door. And uh, w on the time that we finish this house, we find ourselves basically trapped within this house with no escape. And this trapping kind of represents us being trapped by our self-identity. And the more that we build this house, the further we kind of get away from our connection to oneness, right? So only when we are able to give up the house and give up the treasures and toss off our beautiful clothes can we basically return to the jungle where we belong and live in our true nature. So this is kind of the idea that we need to surrender the ego to truly, truly connect uh, to the divine. So in the story, when the monkey gives up on everything he's built, he finds the walls just disappear and he's finally free. So the essential problem with the ego is, is this. It can convert almost anything to its own use. So something that we have to watch out for in our spiritual practices is that the ego is constantly attempting to acquire and apply the teachings of spirituality for its own benefit. So, you know, a danger that we've got to watch out for is that a lot of times the teachings that we learn whether in unity or in books we might read outside of unity is we can treat it as like an external thing, like a philosophy that we're trying to imitate. And often, you know, many of us don't actually want to identify or become the teachings. We'll go through the motions and make the gestures, but we don't really want to sacrifice any part of our way of our life and we'll fall prey to becoming amazing actors and find comfort in pretending to follow the path but not actually following what the path is actually telling us so and when when this will happen we might feel a, a, a slight discrepancy between our actions and the teachings that we know in our inner knower as terry would say and and when we find a discrepancy like this usually the conflict is very very effectively smoothed over so there's another analogy I'd like to bring in here where it's kind of like the the ego is 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 like a country where the church and state are supposed to be separate. But if the policy of the state ends up being different from the teachings of the church, then usually what will happen, especially in medieval times, is the king will go to the head of the church and get their blessing and the head of the church will work out some justification and give their blessing under the pretense that, well, the king is the protector of the church and the protector of the faith, so the king must be right. Well, in our, in our minds, this works out much the same way. So we'll have some desire or some notion or something that we might do, and we might know inside that this isn't the most spiritually fulfilling thing for us to do, but our ego will work as both the king and the head of the church, and it will reassure ourselves with its philosophy and logic, making everything seem rational. Uh, it's kind of like we have, you know, that we, we, we're basically self-rationalizing machines, right? So the king will have some desire, and then it'll go and get the spiritual green light to conduct whatever actions we desire, almost like we're doing mental gymnastics at an Olympic level. And you know, this is something that we just have to watch out for. Everyone does it at some point. So it's essential to see that the one of the main goals of our spiritual practice is to step out of this bureaucracy, 
which means stepping out of our, and this also means we have to step out of our desire for some higher, more spiritual, more transcendental version of knowledge, religion, virtue, or whatever it is. And this is what I call spiritual materialism. And th well, sorry, not what I call spiritual mater materialism. Actually, this term spiritual materialism was coined by a Buddhist monk named Chagyam Trumpa. And I watched a talk by him a long time ago. And I, I had this idea in my head of spiritual materialism from what he said. And it basically what it means is the use of spirituality to fuel our own egos. So at its most harmless level, which is usually what some of us might do accidentally, it can be seen as almost like a collection of spiritual trinkets perceived by ourselves as knowledge or practices or concepts we have gained, like this treasure trove that we've collected into our house and we'll display it proudly to others, like, like some sort of great display that our ego is putting on as though this house that we built is like an antique shop. And some people might specialize in Oriental and Eastern antiques, and some people might specialize in medieval Christian antiques or antiques from some other civilization or time. But no matter what antiques we've collected, ultimately, unless we are becoming the teachings and are really living the teachings and not having them as, as things in our, in our mind, but becoming ourselves, Ultimately, we're just collecting treasures for our house prison, and we're proudly displaying it as though it was this wonderful, like, museum collection or something, instead of what it, what it can often be, which is just fuel for our own perception of ourselves. But unfortunately, this is just the most harmless level of our ego using spirituality for its own gain. So uh, to go to the other extreme, the most harmful level of spiritual materialism is when we see spirituality in this prize-seeking quest is, is kind of what I call it. So sometimes instead of collecting antiques, a really zealous adherents of religion throughout history will seek these imaginary prizes for themselves. Sometimes that might be the prize of glory or holy victory, which is seen off, you know, in the Crusades. And, you know, we, we can see some evidence of that even in the past couple hundred of years. Or the worst of all uh, is the great prize of being allowed into a paradise after death. And this is definitely the most sought after uh, prize of them all. And some people might be inclined to see those who will seek even at the cost of their own lives to gain this prize as in the service of their religion as having transcended the ego because if they're so willing to see their own lives lost or see themselves destroyed in the service of this higher power, then they must have transcended their ego's survival instinct. But it's actually the total reverse. So because, and the reason why this is, is, is the ego is not our human body. The ego is the idea of the self. And oftentimes, those who have found themselves on this path of seeking this great paradise prize, they're not seeking the preservation of their bodies. They're seeking the preservation of their idea of themselves, whether that is in a realm beyond death or a preservation of their memories and lasting impact on earth. And very oftentimes, it's both. And of course, the greater impact on the earth that they leave, whether that's a positive or a negative impact, and the more extreme their actions in the name of their faith, the greater this imaginary prize will be in their heads. So these delusional prize seekers are by far the most dangerous of them all because they have the strongest egos. Egos so strong that they will sacrifice the gifts of their own human forms under the illusion that their selves will gain an even greater survival than their physical selves could ever gain, whether that's by the legacy on the earth that they leave or continued survival in a paradise or realm beyond that they'd ever be able to gain by remaining here in their human form. So these misguided individuals are the crusaders, the in inquisitors, uh, the suicide bombers, who are so obsessed with this prize-seeking quest that they would harm others in themselves just to achieve it. And this is 
the worst kind of spiritual materialism there is because they're so focused on preserving the idea of themselves that they'll go to any means to do it. And I can only imagine that those who undertake such acts visualize their, their bodies in the next life being transformed into angelic beings, but with their same human face. Or perhaps they literally imagine their bodies looking precisely the same, but just existing in a new realm of paradise. And the reason why I think this is true is because in a lot of their ideas of heaven, to enjoy the supposed rewards in the next life that they want to enjoy, they would need to maintain some semblance of their human form in their idea of heaven or paradise to be able to enjoy what they think they will receive as their eventual prize. Now, us at Unity know better that we know that our true spiritual selves are not our human forms. And when we truly align ourselves with our spiritual selves, we have no desires for great rewards in paradise. We have no, we're, you know, our true spiritual selves are, is above such desires. So we would have no need for the physical ideas that paradise or heaven might have for us. Because once we are able to truly connect with oneness and unity, then we connect with the divine and we are fully satisfied. And if you're fully satisfied, you don't need a reward or a prize for anything, right? So what they don't know is that heaven was available for them to experience all along, but heaven wasn't available for their human selves to experience. Heaven was available for their greater consciousness or inner spirit to experience if they were only able to free themselves from this idea of the self and integrate with the divine. So when, when we as honest seekers of spiritual truth are able to break down our walls and our house, we will experience all the fruits that paradise and heaven has to offer, but we won't experience it as ourselves. We'll experience it in an even more wonderful fashion as a divine being connected to oneness. And while some people out there might be disappointed to realize that there might not be a pearly gate that looks like a gate that a human would build awaiting us, some awaiting some divine copy of ourselves, well, I would offer that they should be inspired that what awaits us instead is a pure love, a pure peace, and a pure joy in a form that our human bodies can't even imagine, but that our spiritual selves are sure to experience. And if we can rise above spiritual materialism and the ego and avoid these offshooting paths that invite us to stray and collect trinkets and show them off or seek prizes on the spiritual path, when we avoid those paths and just follow the one true path to the top of the mountain, there we will experience enlightenment and we will have won the greatest prize of them all, which is the absence of wanting or seeking any prizes whatsoever. And in that moment, we will not experience, but we will become liberation and we will become unity. And I wish you all the Godspeed on your journeys there. Amen. Now we'll do a meditation. Give me just a moment here. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel the mighty power and the grace there's a holy hush around us I see glory on each face surely 
the presence of the Lord is in this place. All right, we're going to do a love and compassion meditation because right now with what's been happening in the world recently, I think that that's the energy that the world needs right now. So I'd like you guys all to start by becoming as present as you possibly can to this moment. So take a deep breath in. And a nice, slow breath out. And as you breathe in, I want you to draw loving energy into yourself. And as you hold your breath in, hold that loving energy like a golden globe of light in your body. And just feel that warmth. Maybe you can picture someone who's close to you, someone who you feel a great amount of love. Maybe it's not a person, maybe it's a book, or maybe it's something outside yourself. Anything that brings that feeling of love and appreciation and joy. And just hold that feeling, feel what that feels like. If you want, you can put your hand on your heart and notice the sensations around it. Perhaps you feel a sensation of warmth or openness or tenderness. Just take a moment and really feel it. Continue to focus on these feelings as you visualize whatever it is that brings you that love. And as you breathe out, imagine you are extending that golden light from the center of your heart and make it reach out to your loved ones, bringing them peace and happiness. So imagine the loved ones in your life and in your mind's voice, silently recite this with me. May you have happiness. May you be free from suffering. May you experience joy and ease. Remember, we're extending our golden light to our loved ones. Now we're going to extend it, instead of from our loved ones, out to the whole world. So once again, we're going to repeat the process to, re to recharge that golden light within ourselves. We're going to take a deep breath and really feel that feeling. Feel the warmth in our heart. And we're going to extend it out to all of humanity. Imagine all the people in the world and extend that feeling out to them. And once again, in our mind, we're going to repeat internally along with me here. May we all be free from our suffering. May we all have joy and happiness. May we all be free from suffering. May we experience joy and ease. Now we're going to do a, a little test of our compassion. So now I want you guys to visualize someone that you might have difficulty with, someone that you might disagree with, or some, maybe it's a group out in the world that is wicked or evil. And us as compassionate, loving individuals connected to the oneness of the divine, we know that everybody is a part of the divine and that in the end we are all one. And that includes those that we might disagree with, that we might not like, and that we might not normally feel compassion for. But right now it's time to practice true compassion. So 
I want you guys to visualize that person or thing or entity in your mind. And once again, we're going to take a deep breath in. Hold that globe of warm golden light in our chest. And then extend that love and compassion out to this person or thing. And as I repeat this, in your mind's voice, repeat with me. May you have happiness. May you be free from suffering. May you experience joy and ease. May you have happiness. May you be free from suffering. May you experience joy and ease. Now we're going to try and hold the whole universe in our mind's eye. Imagine all the galaxies and the stars and maybe other dimensions, other life forms that might or might not exist out there, all the animals of the world, all the various planets. And one more time, we're going to take this light within our chest, this feeling of warmth if you need to recharge it, Go back to visualizing someone or something that you love very dearly until you can feel that feeling again. And once again, we're going to take that golden light. We're going to hug or extend that light out to the whole universe, to all of creation. And we're going to say, may all of creation have happiness. May all of creation be free from suffering. May all of creation experience joy and ease. May all of creation have happiness. May all of creation be free from suffering. May all of creation experience joy and ease. Now we're going to take a little moment of silence. And as we enter into the silence, I want you to take that same feeling and now we're going to apply it to ourselves. Take that same golden feeling in your heart, that golden light. As we go into silence, I want you to bathe in it and feel it. Let your Start allowing your spirit to rise above the body and just live in that feeling for a moment. Now you guys can sing along with me as we exit our meditation. Slowly bring your awareness back to the room, to your feet, starting from your toes, gently rising your awareness up your body. And return to the present as we sing. Hallelujah. 